Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Right, we're ready. <laughs> now, um, before we start, you will all be aware of the events of the past week or so, and the lady herself is looking down on us. And so we will start with a few moments of silence in honour of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Very good, thank you. And so on to the programme for tonight. And <clears throat> we start this session. I'm glad to see we've got a, a good uh, attendance here, which is a good sign for the future because we are trying to get away from the idea of Zoom meetings and I think everybody should be reasonably well spaced out and, uh, and safe. So please don't... Uh, crowd everybody and we should be hopefully safe. Uh, if I disappear in a minute or so it's just to get a, 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 a plug for my uh, for, for the recorder uh, for, the, for the video. We are videoing the meeting so anybody who can't be here will be able to uh, view it online. Okay, our speaker tonight is Simon Kidd whom I've corresponded with by email but never actually met in the flesh and he comes from, is it Wellen? Letchworth. Letchworth. He's a member of the Letchworth and District Astronomical Society. And one of his interests is, as you see there, asteroid occultations. Now, the occult is not something we normally dabble with, but <laughs> on this occasion, it's a very astronomical topic. And I won't try and... So you the past first five minutes of Simon's talk, so I hand straight over to Simon. Okay. Right, there we go. It's working. Fantastic. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for asking me along. Uh, hopefully this will be of some interest to you. Um, it's in three parts, this, really. Um, firstly, what is an asteroid occultation? You may know, or you maybe double dutch you, I don't know, but uh, the basic geometry of it is what we'll be looking at. And then um, the reasons why it might be interesting and useful to do these uh, observations, both from a scientific point of view and from a, just a, a fun general um, amateur astronomy point of view. And thirdly, um, the practical aspects. Um, you know, if you do want to observe one of these events, what equipment do you need? Um, and that's obviously from my point of view. There's, there's lots and lots of ways of doing this, but uh, I've settled on a way that seems to work, and uh, that's what I can tell you about. So um, we'll dive um, straight in and ask the question, what is uh, an asteroid occultation? Um, well, in many ways, it's like uh, a total eclipse of the sun. Um, but instead of the sun, you have a star. The sun is a star. But instead of the moon, you have an asteroid. So it's possibly not quite as dramatic as a, a total solar eclipse, but uh, there are similarities. So you can see from this um, graphic that light arrives from the star, is partially blocked by the asteroid, and casts a shadow, although you can't see it obviously, on the Earth. And uh, providing we have enough observers in the right places, we can tell the width of the shadow and its extent. Uh, obviously, uh, this is not to scale. Um, let's, well, let's hope it never is to scale, because that would be... Well, I guess you get that, yes. <laughs> uh, 
where are these objects? Where are these asteroids? Well, you probably know this. And most of them uh, live beyond Mars, but inside the orbit of Jupiter. And I believe they're being shepherded there by gravitational effects. So that's where most of the main belt asteroids are. There's uh, a load more of them in front of and behind Jupiter um, in its orbit, uh, in a stable sort of uh, uh, further shepherding of um, asteroids. And there are some others a long, long way away beyond the orbit of Neptune. And now all of these can be um, observed by these op occultations. Some of them are very, very small, just a few hundred metres or less. Uh, others are quite big, 200 miles. But um, they are all of interest for various reasons. Um, so one day I didn't have much to do and it was uh, a clear night and I thought, well, what's on? And I saw that uh, there was an occultation. Uh, Sapientia um, was occulting a, a reasonably bright star. So this was 2015, yeah, a little while ago now. And I thought, well, I don't know. I'll try and find the star. I'll try and set my laptop clock so that it's roughly right. And I might even run the camera on it to see, see what happens, see if it's of any use to anyone. So you can see two stars there, hopefully. One top left, one bottom right. Uh, the one that's going to be occulted, we hope, I hoped on the night, is the bottom right-hand one. So if I uh, run that, uh, this is exactly what I saw on the night. So off it went, a bit of uh, twinkling going on, and then all of a sudden, gone. Disappeared. <laughs> and quite a long time. And I was surprised that how totally it disappeared and for how long. Now, this isn't necessarily typical, as I might describe later, but after about 15 seconds, <laughs> we're back. And I, I was kind of amazed by it, because whoever sees a star disappear <laughs> and then come back again. Um, so I, I thought that was, that was kind of great, and it was predicted with quite good accuracy. I have to admit, it was spot on. <laughs> so I thought, well, that, that's interesting. You know, what, what's, what's the point of all of this? And uh, it's not you know, just for, you know, a fun thing to look at. There must be some other things that you can do with this. Anyway, that was the beginning of my interest. Um, so what, what is the point? There's quite a few reasons, actually. Um, firstly, because the positions of the stars are so well mapped, are well known today because of um, Gaia, spaceships like that, you can say that uh, when a star is occulted, you know the asteroid position extremely accurately for that point in time. So this can give a very accurate position and hence an updated orbit for any uh, occultation event, provided you've got the time uh, that accurate. It's possibly the most accurate way of determining um, positions of asteroids. Um, in fact... Um, if you're going to send a spaceship to rendezvous with uh, very distant objects uh, beyond Neptune, uh, this is the only way really to get it accurate enough, believe it or not. And indeed, uh, for um, this particular object, <laughs> there we are, um, at the time known as uh, 2014 MU69, um, the New Horizons spacecraft uh, was sent to rendezvous and before that, there were many observations made um, using lots of different telescopes um, to observe occultations, to refine the orbit, to know exactly where the asteroid was and hence exactly where to send the spacecraft, including the Airborne Observatory. You know, the, I think it's the 747 with a, a telescope in, in the roof almost. Um, that must have been some interesting mathematics, actually, because that's probably flying along at, uh, I don't know, 500 knots or something as well. So knowing your position and time, you get the idea. You get a very accurate, updated orbit um, after all the calculation. Uh, this object, successfully rendezvoused, is now known as Ultima Thule, I think it's pronounced. And it's uh, a contact binary, so quite possibly two separate objects that have kind of joined together, but not actually merged. Not enough gravity for that size object, I guess. Um, 
And of course, uh, this sort of idea of um, obtaining accurate positions is very important if there's uh, objects flying around, which there are, that could be of danger, near-Earth objects. Uh, here is an object. I don't know if anyone knows, recognizes that, but it was in the news uh, quite a, a long time ago. Um, it's called Apophis. And a, a few years ago uh, was reckoned to be quite a dangerous thing, probably still is, but there was a significant chance that it would hit the Earth in 2029. Uh, there's another date beyond that where it comes extremely close as well. Now, thanks to... Um, uh, monitoring of this object, we now know that it won't actually do that. It'll still come extremely close, but we're pretty sure, I say we, they are pretty sure that it won't hit the Earth. Um, it will come extremely close, though. It will come inside the orbits of the geostationary satellites. Wow. That's close. That's really close. But because the orbits are so well known and refined, they're working to this level of precision now that we, we can sleep easy, maybe. Uh, but this will be quite something. Yeah, in the night sky, I think it's going to be a, um, a visual uh, object, and it'll presumably be drifting at some slow speed across the sky, just about safely out of reach. Um, the size and the shape, even three-dimensional uh, sh uh, shape of asteroids can be found. Uh, mostly for the bigger objects these days. Uh, this, is, this is starting to overlap with prof professional techniques as well, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll explain that as we go. First of all, the size of the asteroid. If I go back to the uh, original graphic there, you can see that the light from the star, because it's such a long way away, the star, the light is virtually parallel. So if you measure the size of the shadow, that is the size of the asteroid, more or less. So that's quite handy, providing you have enough observers to define the extent, sideways as it were, of the shadow. Now it's very unusual you get that sort of uh, uh, arrangement of observers neatly in a line <laughs> um, across the shadow, um, but nonetheless um, various, your various positions on the Earth can be compensated for, providing you know your exact location. Uh, yeah, there we are. Width of shadow, width of asteroid, more or less. Uh, here's a more realistic um, setup. Um, we have a shadow going from North America across the Atlantic. Uh, observers, if you can see that, uh, at A and E will not see the star disappear. Um, so in a way, that kind of helps to define the shadow. Uh, observers B, C and D will see the star disappear, but for different lengths of time, mm. according to how wide the asteroid is uh, at that particular point. Uh, so if you um, correlate all those results and take into the fact that there are different uh, lengths along the paths, you can get a result. So uh, that's not actually what you've just seen. This is another one. But um, this is a sort of very basic result with only a few observers. But you can see that um, um, once the, the positions of the observers have been taken into account, the, the chords, as we call them, uh, define the shape of the object. Uh, yes, I think I was involved with that one. That's, that's second from the top. So I'm glad to see it more or less correlates with the other ones. Um, it's only a sort of a best fit sort of ellipse thing. It's not meant to be highly accurate at this stage, um, but uh, it, that, that's generally quite a good agreement and is showing um, the error bars as well, um, which aren't, aren't too bad in this case. Um, now, along with this, um, the professionals with um, some clever photometry um, techniques can actually start to define the actual three-dimensional shapes as well. And it's, uh, it's satisfying to uh, know that they are compared with the results that we get from occultations as well. So you can see that, generally speaking, that's, that's starting to come together. It certainly supports the uh, observations quite well. Um, right, there's the possibility of discovering uh, moons 
or rings or something else around an asteroid, sort of uh, unknown features that haven't been uh, seen before. So that's quite exciting. Uh, here is uh, asteroid Ida uh, with her tiny little moon uh, Dactyl. Um, sometimes, of course, they're more or less equal size, or there could be a big difference like there is there. So what would we see if it was a double asteroid going by a star? Now, I have to say, you normally wouldn't be able to see the asteroid. <laughs> I think that's fairly obvious what's happening. Um, you see a double dip in the light curve. Um, sometimes you do see the asteroid, so when the star is eclipsed, some light is left behind. That usually happens when there's a very big asteroid, and then you are seeing the light coming back from the asteroid itself, but that tends to happen only with the very big ones. Um, so if you see one of those when you're observing, that's quite exciting if uh, nobody has said that it's likely to be uh, a, a double asteroid. So here's a real example. Quite a few more people uh, took part in this uh, observation, which was uh, good to see. Um, yes, uh, number, asteroid number 87, Sylvia, and uh, two known moons, Romulus and Remus. Uh, now, it just so happened that two observers picked up the moons. So this lower one, if I get my cursor work, I don't know if you can see that, there's a very small occultation there seen. So this observer on this track here saw a very quick extinction of the star and then nothing because it missed the main asteroid. This observer saw a very quick occultation of the other moon and then a much longer occultation of the main asteroid. So that was a very lucky um, occurrence to pick up both of them. Um, so a good observation and, and um, refine, starts to refine the orbits of the moons round the asteroids. Now that's not to say that the moons are always trailing along or in front of the asteroids. Sometimes they're a bit out to the side and so on. So even if you're not predicted to be on the track of the asteroid shadow itself, if you're observing to one side, it's still worth observing, firstly, to define the limit of the shadow, and secondly, you might pick up a moon that's actually orbiting in the other direction. Um, yes, yeah, so 40-something uh, observers there, so a good, good result there. Right, now here we have two dips on a notional light curve. You could discover a new double star as well as, or instead of, uh, a double asteroid. But... Which is it? How do you know? Well, there is a, a fairly logical way, a generic sort of way, that you might deduce this. Um, if the dips um, were more or less to the same level, it's more likely to be a double asteroid. If you think about it, a single star, it's occulted by the first asteroid, it dips to a certain level. It's occulted by the second asteroid, it dips to the same level. But if it's a double star, um, it's unlikely that the um, two elements of the binary double star are exactly the same level. So it's quite likely that the, um, the dipped level, if you like, is different. I mean, you know, you can't say that is always true, but uh, that's a sort of rule of thumb if you see uh, a double dip in your uh, light curve. And uh, several new double stars have been detected like that, um, where they're obviously not visually uh, visible and probably haven't been detected by spectroscopy either. But for whatever reason, new double stars are uh, found from time to time like this. If you get a double asteroid with a double star, uh, yeah, I don't know, it sounds a bit complicated. <laughs> but anyway... Now, this, this is a very uh, interesting one that happened a while ago, uh, v kind of lucky in a way. Um, two observers in Australia uh, who are not too far apart. There's one uh, marked there on the, on the map and one there. We're expecting to see, um, at some stage, a large, uh, the shadow of a large asteroid pass by, but possibly only 
um, covering one of the observatories. Um, so this observer was expecting to see an occultation, and this one wasn't. Uh, by the way, the, the convention here is that the green line is the centre and the, the blue is the, are the edges uh, on, on other maps as well that you might see later. Uh, so here we go. This is, a, this is a, a sort of nice animation that shows what was expected, but then something very surprising happened. So I'll just run that. So here we go. This is what was expected. One large shadow, missing one, hitting the other. What actually happened was this. Both of them saw an occultation at slightly different times. Now, apparently, it, from, from the maths, it was impossible that this object was that huge, that it was a single huge object that had suddenly you know, produced this great big shadow and occulted uh, a star visible to both of them. So it was deduced, definitely, even with those two observations, that this was, in fact, a double object, so not a single uh, object, but uh, uh, two objects of the same mass that they thought it was before. So, very lucky. <laughs> you know, can't get much luckier than that, really. And, and the fact that it was clear as well. Although in Australia, it probably is clearer than uh, it's here. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's very satisfying um, to send in results. When you've got a result, you've got the timings right, you've, 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 you've seen the event, um, and you send it all in, and it's all collated. You get results that you can see on the internet. You get the, the graphics. Uh, it's, it's satisfying. And you never know where um, that, that uh, data gets used in further research by, uh, on specialist programs. And uh, occasionally that pops up as well. So, so you never know what's going to happen. Uh, to the results that you send in, and you actually never know quite what you're going to see when you look at an occultation event. It's like looking at the planets. You never quite know what's going to happen or what you're going to see. So, um, interesting, I think. <laughs> now, uh, we uh, digress here for a little advert for something that's happening in a few hours' time, uh, seven hours or so. Uh, this isn't, strictly speaking... Um, an asteroid occultation. It is a kind of occultation. Uh, tomorrow morning, um, Uranus uh, occults uh, a reasonably bright 11.9 mag star. Uh, the actual occultation uh, by Uranus is going to be very difficult to see. Um, the more interesting thing, I think, for amateurs is that the uh, Epsilon ring, the dark, the most opaque ring, um, will occult the star. So using the same techniques... Uh, in theory, it will be possible to see the various dips uh, of the star that are caused by the ring. So, detection of the ring, you know, by another means other than visually imaging it. So, that, that could yield some very good data, actually. And, of course, with uh, larger instruments, you, you, you might well be able to detect uh, other dips of the other rings as well. But I think for amateurs, this, this is possible in the near-infrared um, I was thinking of uh, having a go. Uh, the more I see of the weather forecast, uh, yeah, I don't think it's a go, really. Uh, but I will look out and see what's going on. And certainly people have been doing tests already to determine um, what best filters to use and whether their telescope is, is up to it or not. So, but uh, worth a look. I mean, Uranus is pretty easy to find. So, you know, if you find Uranus, you found the star. So, uh, so, so presumably... Uranus being so large, it's, the, the shadow is enormous, it's much larger than the Earth. Yes, in fact, it covers the whole Earth. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so. And how can you tell what the line of the star will be through Uranus and the rings by looking at that diagram? Uh, yeah, I don't think this diagram, I, I don't quite, to be honest, I don't quite understand this diagram right. um, anyway. <laughs> Even though it was issued for this event, I'm, I'm not quite understanding the, the, the motion and so on, uh, where that's involved. But um, an 11.9 mag star that close to Uranus, I think it'll be obvious. And if you're watching for a short period of time, I think, well, you know which direction it's going. It's going towards Uranus. So, uh, yes, I, I wasn't very clear about that diagram either. It's the only one I could find at short notice that mentioned this event. I thought it would be a band going through it. 
no, so I think that's, the width of the Earth. I think that's the view from the star hmm. at Uranus with the Earth getting in the way. Uh, yes, the Earth, the Earth is the right size compared to the, the disk of Uranus. So I'm, I'm, I'm not fully across that diagram, to be honest. But um, It looks like the shadow is superimposed upon the Earth. Yes, well, that's, that's um, yeah. Looking at the prediction uh, diagram, I think the whole of the Earth is, is definitely covered for Uranus. Yeah. And, and, of course, a part of the ring would, would be for the whole of the Earth as well, therefore. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, I digress. No asteroids involved. <laughs> uh, right. Observing them. Um, it's, it's good if you have um, a, a view south, of course. Um, these things, generally speaking, are, are lined up somewhere near the ecliptic. Um, and my telescope, the, uh, the usual sort of uh, C14, which has done me well over many, many years, and a, a G11 with Go2. I do find the Go2 uh, very, very useful, actually, because um, if you're getting up in the middle of the night, you don't want to spend absolutely ages tracking down these objects and these stars. So, um, yeah, it, I would say it's almost essential, unless you just want to observe one or two yeah, in the evening at more civilised hours. I would say, yeah, you do need some help with uh, quickly finding things. Um, what other equipment is needed? Well, not a lot, actually. Uh, a camera capable of video. Um, there is a technique where stills cameras are used, where you just let the um, the star trail across a still image. And of course that's a very accurate clock because the Earth is rotating at a very nice constant speed. So you get a gap in the star trail which can be used to determine the duration, at least, of the occultation. Uh, not many people do that nowadays. Uh, I think the, the, um, the way of working it out is not as accurate as uh, we, we can usually achieve these days. So, um, yeah, a camera, a laptop, some sort of capture card if applicable, um, capture software, uh, fire capture and sharp cap are free. Um, sharp cap is generally preferred, I have to say. It's been developed more with timing in mind, um, although people have used fire capture. And uh, Genica is very good. Uh, that's um, reasonably cheap uh, and very capable capture program as well. Uh, Sir format where the time is written into the frames as well in the metadata. Uh, you don't actually have to time stamp the frames themselves. Uh, yes, you have to set the time very accurately. Uh, we use the laptop clock to um, generate the times for the frames, and of course, you have to set that accurately. Um, more on that later. Uh, the general aim is for uh, a tenth of a second or better, but it just depends on the brightness. If you've got a very um, very faint star, you'll need quite a long exposure to just record it. So in that case, you may only get an accuracy of half a second or so. If it's a very bright star, you could easily uh, beat a tenth of a second. Um, so it just depends. Camera choices. Well, there... Um, you can use an analog video camera, and for a long time that's a sort of gold standard, really, surprisingly, in a way. Um, I mean, the Watek 902 is a very sensitive camera, and in some ways very suitable uh, for seeing faint objects at a high frame rate, so a good camera. Uh, and using uh, an inserter that puts in the time stamp at the analog level means that it can't be affected by anything going on in the laptop. So you've already stamped it by the time it gets to the laptop. So this can be a very reliable way of, uh, of doing it once you've established the hopefully consistent delay that this system produces. So um, people still use that, and, and it, it does seem to work very well, but I think there's, a more, there's quite a bit of technical work to establish the delay of your particular setup. And once you've got that, then, yes, yeah, so you can just carry on um, using that um, in the future. Um, yeah, uh, maximum time resolution, yeah, it's only, only um, 50 fields a second or 25 full frames. 
So you can't run any faster than that. You can run slower, of course. You can integrate the, the, the frames, um, so, so that's no problem there. Or, of course, something um, a bit more modern, I suppose you could say, um, CCD or CMOS cameras. Um, they're very reasonably priced these days. Um, all the software is available. Um, you can change the ROI, the, the region of interest, so you can record at a high rate with a very small frame and not take up too much room on your hard drive. Um, you can run the cameras very, very fast for bright events. And, of course, uh, features like binning to either improve the signal to noise or reach fainter stars. Uh, the main disadvantage, and, and this for a long time, I, I think we're getting away from this now, but it's, it's the fact that um, Windows is not a real-time operating system. And unbeknown to you, it could have put your little time-stamping operation on hold while it does something else. And then, of course, unbeknown to you, your time-stamping is actually wrong, and you don't realize it um, because there's no way of checking. Um, here is, I think, oh no, no <laughs> jumping ahead. This is another way to go. Um, you may have seen this camera advertised. Um, this is the uh, uh, a similar camera. It's 174 chip, Sony chip. Um, so the front end is very similar to some other cameras, but it's got a built-in GPS receiver that actually stamps the time, the frames, before they leave the camera to go to the laptop. So that's great because. Windows is not involved in the time then, and um, that should be great. But they are a little bit pricey. Um, but if you're going to do a lot of these, uh, yeah, yeah, until they make you know twenty thousand of them, and the price will come down. But uh, um, yeah, good solution. Yeah. Um, once you've got the the laptop synced, whatever you, however you do that. that you know, is that the end of it? How accurate or consistent is the laptop clock? Well, you, you probably have a rough idea from your own laptops anyway. It's actually rather poor. Um, I think my, this laptop <laughs> probably loses about a second a day. So that's not very good. Not, not good enough. Nowhere near good enough, especially if you, you know, leave it for a few days and you come back to uh, try and resync it. But um, so... Syncing the time, which I'm, I'm sure you know you can do from the web, um, is, is not a particularly good idea. Um, the web can work quite well, but there's always an unknown involved. You know, which server is addressing for this time signal and so on. Um, so it's, it's not recommended to use anything to do with the web for, for timing purposes. So we need something else. Uh, something a bit more accurate. Um, there's an old version of something pretty accurate. GPS, of course, had to um, be involved at some stage because it's so convenient. And um, actually, this was my um, interim version. I have a GPS um, aerial and a combined GPS server. Okay, a little unit, standalone unit, that is hardwired to the laptop. No internet, no Wi-Fi, nothing with any delay possible there. It's still using something called NTP, Network Time Protocol, which is the system used over the internet to sync computer time, but it's not over the internet. <laughs> It's just using the NTP system itself, but not the actual transmission system. It's just all coming down a wire. And that should be extremely accurate. The limits of NTP is, uh, I think, stated as uh, less than one millionth of a second. So it's potentially very, very accurate. Um, we have some software. Meinberg software seems to be the preferred option for controlling this. Now, it doesn't just keep nudging the laptop clock and setting it right again and letting it go out and setting it right again. It doesn't do that because uh, you could get errors creeping in and you get a sort of wobbly line of errors, uh, even if it's updating it quite often. Um, the software um, kind of learns the errors of the laptop clock oscillator 
and tries to predict when it needs to nudge it a bit. So it tries to um, uh, predict uh, uh, the, the errors and stop them happening in the first place. So it, it can be a very good system. When you see the, the, the graph, it, it also logs it of the output, the offset. It, it's just a very gentle wavy line hovering around zero. It's really surprising how well it does. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's the camera, there's the asteroid, there's the star. So that was the sort of early version. In fact, there was an earlier version I was using, and uh, same as that, only done with uh, a Raspberry Pi uh, mini computer with a little add-on GPS thing as well, which worked pretty well. There, there was a certain disadvantage with it, but, um, um, yeah, you can be done with, with uh, a Raspberry Pi as well. Right, here, here is an interrupt. I talked about that just now. Windows doing its own thing. This is a rather severe example. <laughs> Someone's trying to do a weather forecast on live television, and Windows has decided to do something else. Uh, in other words, send an advert for the latest upgrade. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's what happens during an occultation. You know, we don't get adverts coming up. But you get the idea is that, who knows? Who knows what's going on? You know, it could be some housekeeping thing that Windows has decided to do, and it does it. And we all know how annoying that can be. Um, you can uh, do various things to uh, mitigate that. Yeah, you need an adequate laptop, uh, so it's not under stress. No internet, no Wi-Fi. Uh, you don't need antivirus to slow things down or update itself or anything like that. No unnecessary apps need to be running by definition. Um, you can also, I didn't know about this before, um, you can change the priority of the program uh, in Task Manager to so-called real-time. Of course, it isn't real-time, but it's the nearest you'll get with Windows. So if you go into Task Manager, you can actually set sharp cap to be uh, real-time, so-called. And that will bump it up the priority so that anything else going on might be affected, but not sharp cap. So um, I think with all of those things, there's a pretty good chance that nothing untoward is going to happen. Um, I generally do keep this laptop, actually. I don't use this for emails, and I don't, you know, it's hardly ever on the internet either. So I, I kind of rely on this, and it, and it has done a very good job. And, uh, yeah, check the CPU that it's not being stressed. It shouldn't be while it's recording. Um, it should be running easily within, within its capacity. Um, but what would be nice is if you had an independent way, because there is this tiny, tiny doubt, an independent way of um, confirming that the timestamps are correct. But, of course, you can't involve the laptop or another laptop, or any other computer, because you'll run into the same problem. So, um, uh, having read around the subject a bit, I mean, several versions of, of this, or another you know, idea, have been explored. This is the one I settled for, and it's sort of worked out quite well. Um, what I've added is a flashing light that actually shines on the uh, CMOS chip, um, and that is fed from the one PPS, the one pulse per second of the GPS unit. Now, one PPS is an extremely accurate pulse, and you can get it to drive an LED with no other modifications, really. There's enough power from this BNC socket just to fire an LED. So, no computers, just two wires, and it will flash this uh, LED, um, and it's the beginning, it's when it turns on, that is the very, very start of the next full second uh, of universal time. So um, that was the idea. Now, it doesn't tell you the time itself. It just tells you the beginning of the second. But that goes a long way to verifying that nothing untoward is happening with the, the time stamping. So how was that done? Um, well, there's the one PPS signal from the GPS uh, server at the top. A red LED, I'm told red LEDs um, take the least time to come up to full brightness. They're all pretty fast, actually, very fast. And then a single optical fibre, which goes down a brass microtube to hold it in place, 
and shines a little dot of light onto the, onto the sensor. Uh, here's a sort of cross-sectional view of that. Um, the the fibre is hidden a little way up the, the brass tube to stop uh, the light spreading all over the place. There are no lenses involved, and that would only complicate things, I think, and make it rather difficult to set up with focal lengths of tiny little lenses and so on. So um, that's uh, a sort of schematic. Um, and, <laughs> right, eventually, thank you. Uh, this is more or less what you'd see if you use the, yes, the full area of the chip. Um, yeah, this is running in a, in a funny sort of a way. I've, it's on a very slow um, a frame rate, uh, just to keep the frame size, the um, file size down for this demonstration. So it looks a bit sort of jerky and horrible. But you can see the, the flashing light in the right hand, bottom right hand corner. Um, it's not interfering with the rest of the frame. And I, I, actually, I don't often use the full frame. I, I nearly always use a, an ROI, a region of interest, cut it down a bit. Uh, the rest of the frame is completely unaffected by that flashing. Okay, so uh, how's it actually um, done in practice? Well, there's a little project box glued in the best tradition, Heath Robertson tradition, and uh, stuck onto the back of um, the camera. So it's quite compact. Uh, no other connections needed apart from uh, the uh, the wire that feeds it. Uh, yeah, I think we've covered that. This is the uh, business end. You can see the little guide tube of copper, uh, brass, I think, copper, brass, brass, I suppose, painted black, guiding the uh, fibre down to near, near, not touching the chip. And these two holes, uh, screw threaded, were already in the camera. The only thing I had to do was drill this small hole here. So actually, I can put this back to nearly as new, <laughs> um, if, I, if I wish to. But I could still use it for imaging anyway. That, that It doesn't actually get in the way very much at all. Then. The insides of the box, uh, we have the, the uh, phono connector here which uh, takes the signal from the uh, GPS server, uh, comes in here, where's my cursor gone, here we are, uh, goes through uh, a little current limiting resistor, nothing very technical, LED here, okay. Now the LED is shining on the end of the microfiber, uh, fiber optic I should say, uh, which is on the end of this spring. So it's about there, I suppose. And the idea behind, behind this spring and screw thread thing is to adjust the brightness of that amount of light going onto the chip. Because sometimes you want less light because you've got a long exposure. Sometimes you want more because you've got a very fast exposure. You might think, well, that's a bit crude. Uh, isn't there a more sophisticated way of doing that? But most of the ways of controlling, a lot of the ways of controlling LED brightness have electronics, <laughs> which can quite often cause flicker <laughs> on LEDs. So the last thing you want is flicker or delay. So this works. <laughs> it's crude, but it works, and it's worked for several years, and I'm completely happy with it. So it's a solution that, yeah, fits the problem quite well. Um, if you've got a region of interest, you lose that. I always start from the bottom right. Okay. I define the region of interest, so yeah, I'm, I'm including it. It's never in the middle, no. Um, so yeah, you have to incorporate. You don't have to incorporate all of it, just a, a bit of the yes. dot. Yeah. yeah. Right now, if there is anyone present who could help develop this, this would be fantastic. Would there be any way of actually defining, say, the minute flash of one PPS without making it flicker or causing a delay. Could you identify, say, the, uh, the minute flash with, say, a double flash or something so that you could count the pulses if you thought your recording was in trouble and actually say, well, I know what that second was. You know, it was the 32nd second after a certain time. So if anyone uh, can work out a way of doing that, have got any... Uh, 
electronic engineers here, I'd be very interested to hear from you. But as it stands, it's still a very useful way of checking that, that the, the recordings are correct because you expect to see that light come on in the very first frame of the new second. Given that the camera stamps the end of the frame, it only, the, the laptop only stamps the frames once it's got, once the frames have got to the laptop. So, you know, we take, that's all taken into account. But, you know, you need to see that the flash happens in the correct frame uh, before I send off the results. And I can say, well, I, I, I'm pretty damn sure that that timing is absolutely right. Uh, okay, that's the, the carrier, the prototype one. I had it on a different carrier, uh, camera to start with. Those are the components. Uh, you've seen them in the box. Um, yeah, it, it, it goes a long way to doing it, but it's not absolutely ideal. But um, yeah, for the money and the, the effort, it's it, very well worth it. In fact, the other day, I had a problem with the box. It was down to a cable. Isn't it always the cable? It wasn't syncing properly, and I still had the one PPS, and I was actually managed to deduce the actual time uh, that it started from the PPS. So, yeah, it, 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 it has turned out uh, very, very useful. Uh, okay, so now onto a, onto a sort of a quite serious oh my, um, and successful observation. Uh, quite a big asteroid, uh, Electra, was forecast to uh, occult uh, magnitude 11 star. Um, there's the, the path. Uh, there's various things known about it already. Two moons, non-spherical, pretty big. Some of the composition known. And there's a not very good um, composite from the VLT. I'm not quite sure why it's so... Anyway. Um, and this uh, is some of the modelling that had already been obtained from um, photometric analysis of it. Okay. And that is... <laughs> Attractively known as the Dammit um, technique, uh, the database of asteroid models from inversion techniques. Yeah. Right, now the prediction software that we use um, also lets you know who else is going to be observing if they're participating in the scheme. So you can hear, see rather, that uh, we have here um, six UK observers, although it says nine. I think there probably were nine. But anyway, that's the UK. And all of those black lines are the tracks, if you like, of other observers. So that it was very good on this occasion that um, it went completely across Central Europe and incredibly down the middle of Italy. And even more incredibly, it was completely clear <laughs> across Europe. So absolutely ideal. And very useful observers either side, you know, defining... Uh, shadows or picking up any extraneous bits and pieces that might happen. Um, the prediction software um, can have C2A, which is a planetarium software. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a very good software um, as a plug-in, and it will do you a custom map, and I've set it up so that I get the same field of view on the map that I do with my camera, so 40 art minutes. Not, not very wide, actually, but that's a C14 for you. And here is what I recorded. Now, it's not very good quality, this, because I've kind of like enhanced it and blown it up so that you can see it. So it's very noisy and so on. This is the star, and these are the two guide stars that are in included. So here we go. Off it goes. Now, you can see that there is some light left. That is because we're now seeing the asteroid, and it's a very big asteroid, so there is some light. Um, and then later it comes back. Now, uh, I was actually off the predicted um, shadow path. It shifted. It does. The predictions aren't always correct. So I was lucky to see that. Um, this is the light curve that I got initially. Now, the yellow uh, trace is um, one of the guide stars. We always try and include other guide stars to use as a reference uh, for the star that's being occulted. And you can see straight away there's something funny going on. It's getting brighter. Well, that was cloud. So cloud was disappearing as time went by, which was lucky for me. It, it you know, didn't go the other way. 
Um, so you can see the, the uh, guide star um, slowly getting brighter. But we've used the guide star in the software to normalize the target star so that we get a flat response uh, judging by the other stars. So pretty good, sharply defined occultation. One dot uh, corresponds to one frame on this. So you can you get an idea of how the software is working. It's looking at each every each and every frame and assigning a level. Uh, right. You, you, when you've got the results, you send them all off. Looks pretty terrifying that, but it, it's all sort of pre pre filled in, so it's not not too bad. Uh, this is the result we got. It's over. I think in the end, it was over 50 people got a very good um, definition uh, on the shape um, and. Also, with the Dammit modelling, it corresponded very well. Now, something's always worried me about this particular graphic. It looks to me as though if you rotated clockwise the Dammit model, it would co correspond even closer to the actual results obtained. Can you see that? Uh, I don't know why that hasn't been done. or It looks so obvious to me, but um, there must be a reason. Um, maybe one is, is still the expected prediction and the other is actual, I'm not sure. But you can see there is a very close correlation in places between the peaks and troughs of the uh, rather uh, irregular asteroid. So, very good uh, results there. Um, and shows how well um, it can work, you know, both the professional predictions and analysis and uh, the amateur observing effort. And of course, as usual, it's the amateurs who are placed all over the world um, that uh, it can't be replicated by professional effort. Um, right, okay, last little bit about examining um, your results. Um, you've already seen there's some software to um, uh, look at your light curves, um, and, and you really do need that. Say you've got a difficult observation. Now here, this is an animation of an asteroid going, well, maybe to a star. Let's set it running. There we go, it's getting closer. Now, if you were to just look at the screen, and it's getting daylight here. <laughs> if you were to look at that, well, you know, was there a very quick occultation that we didn't quite see, or what exactly happened? Very, very difficult to judge from the screen, so you do need the software to examine it. And um, you've seen one light curve from it already. Tangra is the name of the um, software of choice. And you can see here a much shorter um, occultation with a smaller dip. Again, uh, a guide star uh, above. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it might be quite possible that you miss that in amongst the twinkling if you, if you were just looking at the screen yourself. You know. Here's a very clear one at the other end of the scale. Very nice, sharp edges. No problem analysing that one. Once it's been through that stage, we, we use um, a plug-in called IOTA, which um, analyses much more closely the dips statistically to get your actual timings, both the duration and the, the time it started and the time it stopped. Very, very clever software. Um, which I don't understand, but there's a lot of statistics involved in getting the most likely uh, possibility from when it was occulted. So uh, it can be quite difficult to operate that, but like all things, once you get used to it, not too bad. And there's always people to help, actually, if you get stuck with one of these. Uh, same sort of thing, not quite so clear. And you can see the software doing a good job in um, choosing the most likely possibility for this particular observation. Uh, the width of these uh, bars here is, is showing the uh, error as well. But it's all written down here in the results thing here for you to uh, send off. <laughs> How do you um, know what's going on with events? Well, if I just quickly come out of this, I can show you, um, I think... Occult Watcher, which sounds rather 
dodgy, but um, a cult watcher is what you need. And once you've entered your location and how faint you want to go down to in terms of stars you want to look at for a occultation event, uh, it will produce a list for you of all possible events um, and the probabilities. Um, how it works is this blue area is the shadow, the side-to-side -side shadow, and that's me there. That's my position. So you can see I'm well within the shadow. I should be able to see something uh, on that occasion. You've got all the times and locations uh, and so on to uh, actually help you find it. If you go to a different event, uh, you will see something else. Oh, I'm right, right in the middle of that one. That looks good. But something like that. Well, I'm way off to the side, so it could be still worth observing, but I'm out of the blue area. I'm out of the pink area, which is actually called the one sigma area, again to do with statistics and the probability that you might see something. Um, so that is a very useful um, tool, and uh, actually Uranus is on that as well. I can't show you that because it's not been updated uh, recently, but uh, anyway, let's get rid of that. Go back and finish off. We're nearly there. Uh, right, there we are. Um, yeah, I think I think we've 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 covered um, all I wanted to talk about. Really, um, there are other ways of making useful scientific contributions. Loads of other ways with astronomy, but this is one of them, and um, there's a strong sort of team feeling about it, um, which includes professionals. So, yeah, a lot of people think it's uh, uh, quite a good way to uh, contribute. Um, and, yes, looking at the last line there, as I found out way back in 2015, um, just looking at one is, is, is very, very interesting if you haven't seen one uh, before. And there we are. That's it. <laughs> From, apart from, there are free software. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yeah, get a picture of encouraging to see what could be done and all you need is a C14 and a heavy mount. You could get by with a 60mm refractor. Could you? And the stars come up on that list, mag 7, 8, 9, 60mm refractor. Right. Yep. Okay, so <laughs> any questions now? Yeah, I thought it might be from those two. But <laughs> no tricky ones. No, I'm just going to uh, make a comment. Uh, you, you've been put a lot of effort into this. I haven't because I don't do these very often. Uh, but it is possible to uh, get useful results sometimes with uh, more, uh, quite a simple method. And what I've used is the fourth dimension software, which you've got up there, which is, is a thing that runs in Windows. And that just corrects the Windows clock. Yes. Up with, with the, uh, it communicates with the server. And it... it for, and you can set a frequency of correction, yeah. and that should get y your clock certainly within 0.1 seconds should. Of, of, of the truth. And then I just feed that into that time, Windows time, into Fire Capture, and it stamps it on every frame. Yes. And, of course, you're limited by the frequency of the frames, because if it's a faint object, That's if right. you can only image every second, yes. then you're not going to get an a, a result better than a second. Yeah, actually, the, the first observation I showed you, yeah, I didn't know much about it. That's more or less exactly what I did, and it compared very favourably with other people's observations, and it worked. But you say it should maintain the laptop clock and so on, and that's the problem that um, IOTA, the, the organisation, um, they tend to encourage people to do it a bit better. That's, it's obviously a hundred times better than, than not doing it <laughs> like that. And quite a lot of the time, you'll find it, it does work out fine. 
but there is this niggling doubt that it's not quite re reliable enough for you know really solid scientific data mm. but you're absolutely right you know in theory it should maintain the laptop clock to a very high degree of accuracy but what happens if there's a change a problem you know and you get suddenly get shoved onto a different time server and it all there's a little glitch just for a second or two you know that that's i think is the answer really you know we use fire capture at work for yeah. timing the cutting of a a sheet of PET that was going through a machine right. and, we, and there were problems in the cut and it was failing so we used the camera at a high frame rate and right. time stamped the frames and there were so many problems with it. Oh right, I thought you were going to say it was okay. Missing frames, well, there you missing are. frames there you are. and yeah. the t same time stamp on two frames, two sequential oh, yeah, frames yeah, 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 yeah. and all sorts of problems. Yeah. And I was in contact with Torsten, who's the author of Fire Capture, and he said, well, it's not intended for that. It really, you know, yeah. you're taking it way beyond what it's possible That's right. To do. I mean, I, I've used it before, and, uh, sorry, I'm just going to, I used it before, and I had got reasonable results, and, um, um, probably too much, but anyway, um, reasonable results, but, but yes, other people with very sophisticated um, timing devices, <coughs> actually based on, on um, flashes of light, much as you've seen there, only much more sophisticated, have checked this out, and they, they say they can't really recommend fire capture for exactly the reasons you say. It was never designed to do that. However, Robin Glover, who is the author of Sharp Cap, um, has taken this on. Now, he doesn't guarantee it to be you know, a wonderful, perfect timing device, but he has taken a lot of precautions to make sure it's as reliable as possible. Um, so, yeah, most people who, who use uh, soft, this uh, capture software um, do go for sharp. Have you tried sharp cap at work? No. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, give it a go. Yeah. I have a question. <laughs> at least. If you're right in the middle of the shadow, do you get a diffraction spot? Right. Well, that's an interesting one, which I suppose, yes, I could have included something about that. Um, uh, I, the, the only thing um, I can say is that um, there was a recent event where Pluto went in front of a star. Okay, Pluto, can we call that a large asteroid these days? Um, <laughs> And a team of people, again in Australia, that's where it obviously all happens, tried to get on the exact centre of this shadow because they were expecting a flash, yes. much like a, a gravitational lens, yes. but this time done optically with the um, surroundings, the atmosphere of Pluto. And oh, okay, lens in yeah, rather and than just a diffraction spot. I think the seeing is usually against you there, and, and I'm not sure if a diffraction spot, but certainly these effects of where you are in the shadow are noted. I mean, I know on, on the moon, if you run the camera very, very fast, uh, and you get an occultation, um, we haven't talked about the moon, but if you run it very, very fast, yeah, you can see a diffraction effect. It usually jumps up just before it disappears, and you get you know, an interference effect. Uh, so, so these things, I think, do exist, but... I think, generally speaking, you, uh, with asteroids, I don't think anyone's really looking at that. But it was very interesting with Pluto, and they actually got it. They got this central flash, and it was only seen over a distance of, I think, a few hundred metres. So they had one or two people in the exact spot on Earth to see it, which was, again, incredible. So, uh, yeah, yielding some very uh, valuable data, apparently. I'm not sure how, but that's what they said, you know, so... A naive question, how accurately is universal time defined? Hugely accurately, um, more than sufficiently accurately uh, for, for, for these purposes. Why don't they publish it then? Well, they do, I'm sure they do. They're, they're atomic clocks, aren't they, in yeah. satellites? And, and it's some mm -hmm. minute, minute figure. I'm sure it's well, they published. they've got all these cesium clocks and God knows what, nanoseconds. Yeah. Why don't they tell us? Don't they? 
Oh, why don't you use the information on your on your exercise? Then? Well, because it's not strictly relevant that level of accuracy. We're into another ballpark there of, of you know, I'm I'm talking about tenths and hundredths of a second. I think we're talking about millions of a second. Well, yeah. but, if, if, but if they do that, they'll also publish them in hundredths of a second or milliseconds, won't they? Well, I mean, it's, there's no error. If you're talking about milliseconds, there's, there's no error. That's right. Yeah. There's no error at all. It's fine. It's, it's insignificant. Yeah. Uh, another naive question. <laughs> Is there a, a blind spot between the frames of the, the average camera? That's a good question. Yes. Um, yeah, we assume that one frame ends and the other begins straight away. Yeah. I think most cameras, I, I think... Um, it's pretty much instantaneous. I think, Martin, you might be able to help on this one. But I, most people ignore it. Um, but, yes, certainly at a high frame rate, you think there might be a significant percentage that's well, missed. Would you get half? No, no, every no. Other, no, no, no. Every other tooth? It's nowhere that? near. What I can say is um, it's best if you use... Um, actually, not many CMOS cameras do this, but the 174 yeah. camera is global. global. So all the pixels are exposed at the same time. Yeah. Rolling shutter cameras, like most other CMOS, they actually um, expose all the lines of the picture yeah. sequentially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, it's pretty quick. And if you if you choose a very short ROI, the results are still the, the errors are still insignificant. Um, but yeah, I mean, why not have a you know, in my, uh, my camera, it's a 250th of a second, or anything less than that, and the shutter isn't open all the way. Uh, right, so that's a rolling shutter what's it, uh, ZWO uh, camera? No, it's an ordinary SLR. Oh, yeah, yeah, so it's like a slot going down. That's right, yeah. the curtains. So yeah, that's yeah. right. Well, effectively, that's what you've got, yeah. And um, yeah. as I say, you can use a camera like that, and uh, I contacted ZWO about this. And it's the height of the ROI that you should look at. If you can minimise that, it's just a few milliseconds, which is not too bad. There's a question up the back there. Um, there's a comment there really about the camera shutters. If, if you've got a camera that doesn't have a physical shutter, it's just relying on the timing of the electrical pulses. Well, if it hasn't got a physical shutter, there's nothing to stop any of the photons. Um, hitting the um, uh, CMOS and generating electrons. Oh, well, it's, could you, you summarise the question for the benefit for the, for, the, uh, for the video? Oh, I see. Yeah, you're, you're saying yes that uh, um, there, there's always light coming in to the camera. All that's happening is the, um, the point at which your, um, the electronic sampling. Yes. Is done. So the most you're going to get is the overall time. Yeah. Well, the, the, as I understand it, the, the light hits the sensor, but, but it's after the frame has been generated that it reads it out. Uh, and, the, and then, after that frame is finished, it's all obliterated, and you're back to square one again. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I've, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're you're asking here. I'm not asking. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm just responding to the, the idea well, the gap, be a dead gap, the possible. Yeah. I don't think I, it can be. I've never seen it discussed on you know in all of the information. Um, I, I don't think that sort of thing is a problem. It can't be instantaneous, it can't be, can it? It can't be absolutely instantaneous. But um, I think it's so small that it's, it's insignificant. I mean, no system is ever that perfect, I don't think. We're talking about the readout time of, the, yeah. of each line of the camera, aren't we? Um, on, a, on a rolling shutter, yes. Uh, yes. Um, but, I mean, when one is reading out, presumably on a rolling shutter, we're starting to accumulate charge on the top line again. So you've got a continuous, you know, um, uh, yeah, just continuous. process. So if the reads yeah. the top line, then the bottom line. Yeah. When it's reading the, the second line. Yeah, it goes yeah, back to the, the top. The first line yeah. is now charging up again. 
So, but but in, the, in the context you're talking about, it must be insignificant because you're talking about the time the light stops in the beginning. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Forget all the frames in the middle to the last frame. It's only the last little bit where yeah. you get this this potential for the the, the dead period. All the other dead periods. The, the yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. So it doesn't yeah. make, they don't make any difference. You can't. It's not. Add, it's not additional. No, 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 no. It's just the one potential right at the end where yeah, yeah. it may or may not have happened. Yes, and and usually, I mean, it's very rare to um, use a shutter speed. I would say of over thirty a second. You know, so that's pretty slow in comparison to everything else that's going on in the camera. Uh, usually, um, it's much longer than that, you know, because the stars are quite faint. So, you know, if you're getting uh, 10 frames a second on a, frame, a faint star, yeah. that's pretty good. You know, and 10 frames a second, that, you know, these small things that could happen tend to be, I don't know about completely ignored, but, but nobody tends to uh, uh, compensate for them or, or, or um, suggest that the data is any way invalid. Yeah. I've only ever done this once, and I did it the old-fashioned method, straight to the eyepiece, with a with split, split second. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. Presumably now that would be so out of date it would be useless, you just do it for entertainment. Uh, not useless, no. Uh, if you make an observation and you record what you did, and um, uh, the technique that you used, and you took precautions to make sure it was accurate, and so on, and so on, yeah, people are encouraged to send in um, results like that because you could easily get a result uh, to within half a second. Easily? Yeah. Yes. So? Yeah. The other thing is, um, using your sophisticated electronic <laughs> well. um can you actually deduce the diameter of stars? I mean, imagine what would happen, for example, if Betelgeuse was a color. Yes, there are one or two exceptional cases where it is possible to get an annular, if you like, eclipse. Uh, that the stars are that big, they actually just about exceed the uh, angular diameter of the asteroid. So um, you might get something rather strange happening to the light curve. Um, Especially yeah. with Betelgeuse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, off, got let's hope it doesn't get too big. <laughs> too soon, yeah. It wasn't so much meaning an annular style eclipse. It's simply that the um, instead of it being you're you're you you're going from mag you know say, say mag ten to mag fifteen in a in a millisecond. Yeah. It'll be the, the the down and then the up at the other end would yeah. take at least several milliseconds, and you could then deduce the end of the star. In, in general, the the asteroids are much bigger than the annular angular size of the stars. Yes, so, that's not what I mean. That's not what I mean. So, no, what I was going to say was that means it's instantaneous. Yes, Pretty but much. if the star's got a finite diameter, it won't be instantaneous. Most of them, at the resolution that we're using, don't have any... They're mean, source of light. Yes, yes. yes. So far away. Uh, I, know, I know they do have size, but it's so small that um, compared to the asteroid, it, it shuts it off. And the speed, they're going quite... You know, obviously, it's only taking uh, uh, a very short time for it to cover the star because it is tiny. So it is pretty much instant. Now, in the software, there is um, a facility to tell the software uh, that we think the transition is more gradual. So this is what you're talking about. Yeah. That, so you can lean the, the transition over a bit and tell it to look for... Um, a more gradual change. No. That's exceptional. I haven't come across one yet. No. Uh, in 400 observations, not all of them successful, I have to say. It's more like 80, I suppose. I believe it has been done with lunar occultations. The diameters of stars have been... Yeah, oh yeah, 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 uh, absolutely. Especially if you run the camera nice and fast, you know, like 200 frames a second or something, you will see it, yeah. Mm. It's the speed of the occulting body is also a factor in this. If yes. It, if, if the slower it, yes. it is, the better from this point of view. Well, to see a gradual, yeah, yeah sure, gradual. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And of course, yeah, that can vary. Further out, presumably, they're going a lot slower. So, uh, relatively. But uh, you know that, the, but you could deduce that from the because you know the knowledge of the orbit anyway. You do. Well, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's what you're trying to improve the knowledge of the orbit. Yes, and um, it's always emphasised that. Uh, 
you shouldn't look at the predictions too hard in all of this. Like all good science, you mustn't make it fit what you expect. So you look at it, you don't look too much at the what you think should happen, and okay, if other people have got more or less the same result as you, then that's great. You're, you're starting to confirm something. But yeah, there's a danger in thinking, well, it'll, it'll probably do this. or probably. No, you just have to look at the data, even if it's not very good data, and say, well, what have I got? Have I got rubbish? Have I got something that actually shows something useful? And to be honest, sometimes the, the signal to noise, in other words, the drop, can be so small compared to the noise that you can see a drop, but who knows when it happened? You know, it's just impossible to tell. In which case, you can say, well, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that it happened, but I can only give you that within plus or minus a second. So, there we are. That's what I did on that night, you know. You know that's what I saw. So, yeah, but if, if 50,000 people do that, you've got it pretty well right. Yeah, well, of yes. course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it corroborates other people's... Yeah, and, and they might have had better conditions than you. And, and obviously, people in Italy, swines, all of their stuff is, uh, you know, a lot higher up in the sky. So uh, they're going to get better signal to noise, mostly, you know. So uh, better wine. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> Don't know how to do it. I've got a more administrative question. Right. Do you uh, put your results uh, in through the uh, BAA uh, Asteroids and Remote Planet section as well, or only through the IOTA? Uh, I leave that to Tim Hames, who is the BAA coordinator for that. And you, you, you do correspond with him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a main coordinator for um, the UK, so it goes, things go to him uh, for uh, anything that's queried and eventually get handed on to the European coordinator. Or if there's no query at all, we just send it into the European coordinator and the website has just got, you know, every single uh, result, uh, compilation of results, not individual results, you know, um, of every single asteroid this you know for, for years um, so yeah it, it's all sort of dealt with properly but I don't think no, I'm pretty sure there isn't uh, the equivalent site in the BAA mm. no, as, no. as president I'm just trying to find out no 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 yeah, absolutely doing useful yeah. things or if, it's, or, or if people find it more useful just to go to the, these uh, international collaborative uh, sites and uh, organisations um, all I can say is that the BAA is, is uh, really useful um, to coordinate things kind of locally. You know, we might, we might all email each other a few times in the year saying, oh, this, is, this looks especially good for, you know, like six of us. Um, you know, have you got any notes or are, are you going to... Some people have a mobile set up. They might drive a few miles to get a special cord on the results, you know. So, so that's very well done by the BAA, uh, but ultimately it's fed um, to the European coordinator. And a comment on uh, Trevor's observation. I remember that particular case, and it was very useful to have... Uh, I remember Tim Haynes saying that it was useful, it was just another confirmation. Trevor's visual observation was consistent with the observations of other observers using... Uh, CCD methods in, uh, yes. in, in, in the southeast of England. Yes. So it was, a, it was a useful additional. So there's hope for us all. I mean, and as you said, if we had 50,000 observers all timing to a fraction of a second, then they would actually be as good as 48 yeah, observers. Yeah, yeah. Reduce the error. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Uh, the last question, Ken, as long as it's not too complicated. <laughs> yeah, please. ESO uh, 2000 camera I uh, bought from Oxford Street. Oh, right. Uh, and uh, I tried to operate it. I've used, uh, when I've uh, uh, pressed, when I go to certain places, I get a GPS cutout on it. Uh, they know where I am. They, they, they put a busy sign on it. Uh, and, uh, they, and it shows, uh, when I focus it, it, it won't focus, and uh, this, oh. this is a GPS uh, uh, intrusion on, on, my, on my research. Right, so I mean this GPS is basically giving you location data? Well, I'm, 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 I'm,
I'm just saying, is there a GPS in, in all cameras? Uh, no, no. Uh, it's becoming more common for, for various uses, but uh, uh, there is in most phones, of course. But um, slower than you said. Tell you that. Some of them are blurred. Some of them are blurred. Yeah, uh, I, I can't really comment on that. I, I'm not f familiar enough with with. Uh, we might with, uh, move on yeah. at this point. Otherwise, we could get yeah, very yeah. technical. I'm probably over. Yeah. Well, but, okay. Point, I'd like to thank Simon for a very intriguing talk, and uh, I don't know how many of us are likely to take up the business of asteroid observation, but uh, asteroid occultations, but it is something that a lot of us could, could actually do. So, thank you very much indeed, Simon. Over to yeah. the microphone to David. Can I just uh, pull this out? Oh, yeah. Yeah. David will describe the observations made by members recently and what's coming up in the sky in the next month. Well, uh, there's a lot to say actually because uh, we've had two months since the last meeting. Don't put the lights down quite yet so much. We've, uh, because we've had two months since the last meeting and we've had a lot of clear sky, of course, because we've had a drought, which is not very good for the plants. And uh, we've, uh, we've had a heat wave. So uh, we've actually been able to take a lot of observations. Uh, but uh, before the observa talking about the observations, it's time to it's time to award the prize. It's time to award our observing prize, which is in memory of our uh, late, much loved uh, observing director uh, Bob Garner, who died about three years ago now. And uh, the Bob Garner Trophy has only been awarded once. There are two parts to this award. There is a big shield, which is, will have the names of all the winners on the small shields going round it. And that is the, the part that is passed on from one winner to another the next year after year, and there is also a small one which the winner keeps. And the way that I score this is people who contribute to the monthly observing roundup. They get one point for each time that they contribute. So there's only 11 possible points in the year, because we've got 11 meetings in the year. And so this is what has happened this year, uh, that um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you who the runners-up were. Uh, the fourth place was uh, Dewey van der Meer. He got three points. Third place, uh, jointly, although I, actually I shouldn't put Robin in there because he's not eligible as the chairman. I'm not eligible, and Robin's not eligible, but everybody else in the society is eligible. So we had Douglas Adams in the third place. Second place... Lee Spencer had uh, quite a lot of points, eight points, but there are joint, joint first, Martin Lewis and Kwong Man with nine points. However, Martin Lewis won it last year, so I've invented a new rule, which is that we award it to a new person if possible. So it gives me great pleasure to award the Bob Garner Observing Trophy 21 to two, to Kwong Man. Is Kwong Man here? Come up and we'll see who it was. Somebody took a picture of this, actually. <laughs> well, we've got a video anyway. Oh, we've got a video. Right. Here, here's the little one, and that's the one that you keep. Thank you. Thank you very much. And here is, I'll give you the bag some of them later, and, and there, you, there you are on the big trophy. We are going to get a picture. Which, you, which is the one that you keep for a, a, one year. Okay, so, uh, fantastic. And <laughs> Kong 
Hong is quite a new member, aren't you? You haven't been a member of Wallace that long. Uh, just a few years, two or three years. Two or three years, yeah. yeah. So, well done. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, it, uh, yes, now let's please reduce the lighting. Uh, although we don't need it reduced very much because this is the sun, of course. And Howard, is Howard here? No. Uh, uh, well, he's got a new toy. He's got a 70 millimeter double stacked hydrogen alpha telescope, and he's been getting some fantastic results with it. This one is uh, earlier in the su this summer. This is July the 16th, and a very active sun there with a huge prominence on that limb on the left hand side, and loads of active areas. And uh, here's another huge prominence. That one is uh, 4th of August. And here's a whole sequence that uh, from the 9th of August to the 14th he was able to get images every day. So there's a lovely, that's a lovely set of images there and you can see the features moving across as they rotate from right to left there. There's some very large prominences there as well. And here's a more close-up one, uh, September the 7th, so that's a very recent one. I've been doing a few similar observations by comparison. Here's what I was getting with my uh, Lunt 60mm, which has actually stopped down to 50mm, double stack telescope, so quite a similar result. But I've, I've chosen a slightly different shade of yellow to make mine. <laughs> it's, they're just arbitrary, these colours, because it's done with a black and white camera anyway. Here's an observation by Kwong Man, Jupiter, with a 150mm reflector and an ASI 462 camera, and there is the great red spot in the lower left there. Lower right. Lower right, sorry, and here's another one, which is actually showing up not too well on the projector, not as well as it should do, it's a bit burned out. There's uh, the great red spot there, and Ganymede is just going in or coming out of... Uh, it's, uh, in, it's going in front, I think. It's just going in front of uh, Jupiter. Mm. Hard, hard to tell, but it's, uh, it's, it's some satellite phenomenon. Uh, that's a different telescope. That's a 90 millimeter refractor mm. with a two times Barlow, but it's the, the same camera, color camera. Here's one from Lee Spencer with a bigger telescope. Uh, that's a C9.25 and an ASI 120MC filter. And that's 28th of August. And that's the side of Jupiter without the red spot, obviously. Mercury from Martin Lewis. Uh, the image on the left is actually the image. And the two images on the right are a simulation. The middle image is a slightly blurred version of uh, the simulation based on Mercury Messenger imaging. So that's the, actually what it should look like, and uh, you can see that uh, some of the, you, these confirming that some of the features imaged there are real. And that's done in the middle of the daytime. Mm, yes. Uh, that's, uh, that was the 7th of August at um, about 2 in the afternoon. Again, the projector doesn't produce as good a results as they appear on a laptop screen. Here's Jupiter with Io and Ganymede, and you can see the shadows, and that is uh, 9th of August. And this is uh, with um, Martin's 444mm home-built Dobsonian. And he's now provided a close-up of Ganymede there, and on the left is... Ganymede as imaged by Martin, and on the right is the wind simulation. Mm. It looks rather like Mars, doesn't it? Mm. So there's, uh, we've got quite distinct detail on Ganymede and that uh, bright spot, which is not a polar cap, I don't think, it's just a bright spot. It's a crater area. It's a crater, it's a bright yeah. crater. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah... What's the actual resolution in terms of kilometres there? Do you know, Martin? I don't know. No, right. 
So talking of Mars, this really is Mars. Uh, I took this one on August the 6th. We just compare it with. Quite, quite similar, isn't it? Uh, that was taken with my 14 inch Celestron and uh, a colour camera uh, and a, an ASI sub, a Z, a ZWO120MCS camera. And Mars is nice and high if you wait long enough in the early morning sky. That was at an altitude of 41 degrees. I've done been doing lots of images of Jupiter. It's been possible to, in fact, I'm overwhelmed with images of Jupiter. I never get round to processing them all because we've just had so many clear nights. Uh, that's August the 6th. Here's uh, August the 7th. And that's what the red spot looks like. It's smaller than it's ever been in recorded telescopic history before. And it's got this big eyebrow going round it and all this disturbance to the south of it. And this is the same night that Martin imaged, although I didn't include the actual moons in my image, but there's the shadow of Io and Ganymede again. It's a pity the projector doesn't... Uh, it tends to burn out at the higher levels, so we lose all the subtle detail in the equatorial zone with this projector. Here's Saturn, again imaged with my 14-inch telescope. This is a monochrome image. Just looks like a quite an ordinary, boring image of Saturn. Can you see anything special about it? There's a crate ring. The crate ring is present. Uh, that's not what I was thinking of, though. Polar cap. Polar cap. Sorry? Polar cap, very dark. Uh, it, I don't think that's unusual. There is something rather subtle there. Oh, right. <laughs> Iapetus. The moon Iapetus was in transit across Saturn and it just shows up in that image. <laughs> July the 18th, that was uh, predicted and I mentioned it at the last meeting that it was a thing to look out for. I didn't think that it would be possible for, to see visually and I thought it would be on the limit of imaging at, because of the low altitude of Saturn this year. And yes, it turned out to be on the limit of imaging, but it just showed up in the infrared image. Duncan has been uh, taking some long exposure guided images with his Celestron 11. And this is called IC60 something. 62, the ghost of Cassiopeia. It's a hydrogen alpha glowing region and uh, this is 50, about 50, 150 second exposures stacked. So uh, I can't work out what the total exposure is but it, it's a lot of short exposures. This is uh, one of Dewey van der Meer's images with the Unistellar telescope, which was demonstrated in a previous meeting. And uh, as you'll recognise, very well-known object, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. August the 27th, that was taken on. Here's another one from the Unistellar, which is only about a four and a half inch telescope. The Wild Duck Cluster, Messier 11. And Dewey takes these from Uxbridge, from near the centre of Uxbridge. So, not a dark site at all. Uh, here's another from Lee. This is uh, a more or less edge-on galaxy, NGC 5907, uh, which apparently is known as the Knife Galaxy, and it's in Draco. And that's taken with Lee's uh, C9.25, uh, and uh, it is... 62 minute exposures. Uh, here's a very similar looking galaxy, but this is a different one. This is NGC 891 in Andromeda, so again in rather the northern part of the sky. Uh, and Robin's got a new telescope. Lucky Robin. He has brought a, a Stellar Lyra 150mm Ritchie Schrettier. He wanted something with a longer focal length than his 80mm refractor. 
And this is this Ritchie Sretin telescope is F9. It's 1370 millimeter focal length. Uh, so it means it needs careful guiding to get good results. He says he's been accustomed to getting sharp star images with his 80mm refractor, so he wondered why his star images were quite bloated with this uh, new telescope, but eventually decided it was just the seeing at low elevations that was the reason for the bigger star images. Here's another one with this 150mm Ritchie Chretien telescope. Ritchie Chretien is just an optical system for a Cassegrain arrangement reflecting telescope with two mirrors and the observing position or camera position at the back of the telescope. This is the Blue Planetary Snowball, Blue Snowball Planetary Nebula, NGC 7662 in Andromeda, 24 minutes luminance exposure and 6 minutes of red, green and blue each on the 25th of August, taken from Flackwell Heath in Buckinghamshire. Uh, this is the open cluster Messier 11, taken with the same telescope. 11 minutes luminance exposure, 5 minutes of red, green and blue. So quite a complicated process putting together <coughs> all these filters, four filters, four sets of images through four filters go into making an image like that. And here is the, the ghost of Mirash. So the bright star is Mirash in Andromeda. And NGC 404, the ghost of Mirage, is to the upper right. So called because it looks like it's a ghost image in the eyepiece. And what is it actually? Is it it is actually a galaxy. It's a galaxy. Very close and, uh, in, uh, in line of sight to Beta Andromedae. And um, it just, people think they've got a ghost in the eyepiece, but it doesn't move. Mm. And so that's why it's got that name. <laughs> You can, I have seen it. I was interested to know if I could see it through the telescope. And I can with a 12-inch Dobsonian from home, but not with a smaller instrument. Probably if you were in the dark sky, you could see it with a... Well, if you're one of these Americans with owl eyes, like um, Stephen O'Meara, that's yeah, the name. That's um, but in my case, I need a... 12 inch telescope. It shows this telescope's got good contrast to show that so clearly in such a, a, a bright location in the sky. And uh, again, and this is with Robin's 80 millimeter refractor. This is Messier 16, the Eagle Nebula, and with the famous Pillars of Creation, famous from the Hubble Space Telescope image appearing there in the middle, which are areas of darker molecular cloud overlain on the hydrogen alpha glowing region. 10 60 second exposures and some more exposures in different colours. I'll uh, now run down what we can expect in the next month. Uh, we just had a full moon and so this is what the moon is doing. Uh, we've got a very high last quarter moon, September the 17th and the next new moon will be on the 25th. And we've got a whole parade of planets in the sky, planets galore. Uh, the first one coming round, so we start from the right-hand end of this diagram, which is drawn for tonight, after midnight tonight, from this location. And Saturn is transiting at 11pm, and it's quite low in the sky, it's 22 degrees high, very observable. Uh, Neptune is the next along, Neptune is transiting at 1am, somewhat higher, 34 degrees high, but uh, you'll need a telescope to see that. It's heading for opposition in only about uh, three days' time. Next round, Jupiter is transiting at 2 a.m. It's high up, it's 40, nearly 40 degrees high, and it's the brightest object in the sky apart from the moon. Magnitude almost minus three, very about as bright as Jupiter can ever get. And that's also heading for opposition in a couple of weeks' time. Next round, Uranus is transiting at 4.30 a.m., very high in the sky, 55 degrees high, uh, more or less naked eye magnitude, on the borders of naked eye magnitude. And that comes to opposition in November. And finally, uh, Mars is further east. Mars rises about 10 p.m., 
and it reaches its highest point just as dawn is breaking about 6 a.m. and it reaches 60 degrees high uh, and it has opposition near Christmas time. It's now bright at magnitude minus 0.3 and uh, it's uh, extremely well placed and will be extremely well placed for the remainder of this year. But quite small because it's an apelic opposition. Uh, that means Mars is a, a, on, in the part of its orbit where it's relatively far from the Earth because of the highly elliptical, or highly eccentric shape of Mars's orbit. And there's a sequence of uh, attractive close encounters of planets with the Moon coming up. On the 14th of September, uh, in the late evening, you'll see Uranus only uh, one degree from the Moon. If you get uh, Get it in. Get it when uh, they're, they're just rising. Twenty late evening, twenty degrees above the horizon. Uh, you should be able to get the moon and Uranus in one field of view in a, in a small telescope. Uh, then a few days on, seventeenth of September, uh, the last quarter moon has caught up with Mars, and in the late evening. Uh, they will be just three degrees apart on the late evening of 16th of September, just after uh, the pair had risen. And if you follow them into the early morning of 17th of September, they will get very high up indeed. Can you saw that slide for a minute, David? And <clears throat> one thing I just noticed today, and that is that Mars is currently quite close to Aldebaran, two bright objects, Mars and the lighter of two. Over the next few a couple of months, Mars will be moving in that direction, as it does around the <coughs> around the solar system, around the ecliptic. And then, and the point is that you can actually plot its positions quite clearly by reference to the bright stars um, uh, Aldebaran, Zeta Tauri, and Beta Tauri. And you'll find that Mars actually goes between those two. Then it starts to come back in November and December. And then it finishes up about uh, up about there, close to the Pleiades. It never gets to the Pleiades and starts coming back again. So if you want to actually follow the movement of Mars, this is a good time to do it because there are plenty of bright stars nearby to do it with. Okay, thanks. And it's also a good occasion to compare the colour of Mars with that of Aldebaran. Mm. They're quite similar in colour, but uh, Mars is more red, and you you can see how Mars has a steady light, whereas Aldebaran uh, being a point source flickers a lot more, but they're quite comparable, and Mars is brighter than, considerably brighter than Old Debrun. Uh, looking forward to the 8th of October, just before our next meeting, uh, the Moon has a close encounter with Jupiter. It's two degrees below Jupiter on the evening of the 8th of October, so you might just get them in a, in a field of a small telescope simultaneously as well. And the moon, of course, uh, is about half a degree in diameter, so that's where you can judge the, these distances in the sky. And also, just before our next meeting, Mercury will be quite well placed in the dawn sky. Uh, on the 9th of October, which is the day before our next meeting, it has its highest altitude at dawn, and 30 minutes before sunrise it will be 11 degrees high. It's magnitude of first magnitude plus one so not that bright in a very bright sky tricky to observe should be possible with binoculars or a telescope but of course you need to be remember to put those away as soon as the sun comes up there are some meteors coming up uh, towards the um, well, in, into October, and I'll mention these again next month, the Orionids are quite a good shower, uh, zenithal hourly rate of 20, and uh, they have fast meters, often with persistent trains, and from the point of view of moonlight, this will be a very uh, suitable occasion to capture them, and they, they're supposed to start up at the beginning of October, but uh, they have their maximum in the middle of October. And finally, a very early notice, that we are planning public observing at the Lido, at Ricelip Lido again, and this will be in December. 
So put these dates in your diary. Friday the 2nd of December to Sunday the 4th of December uh, at 6 o'clock in the evening we will be showing families uh, and uh, groups of children as shown here the planets particularly uh, and uh, Jupiter uh, and Mars will be very well placed at that time uh, and also uh, Uranus and Neptune and the Moon. So uh, that's early notification of that. So uh, that's all I have for you uh, this month. Thank you very much, David. Excellent. We don't have yet a speaker for next the next meeting. It will take place in, on the second Monday in October uh, at the Uxbridge meeting place. But I'm afraid we can't tell you yet. The speaker has yet to confirm. Is that right? We haven't yes, any, yes, it's a surprise. But, uh, we will let you know in due course, and we hope it will be a live meeting. The November one will be um, will be take place in this room, but it will have a Zoom speaker. I think that's that's how it'll be, unless the COVID situation gets worse, in which case we're all at home watching on Zoom. So uh, let's just keep our fingers crossed for that. Uh, so uh, look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.